Hello, literacy leaders and champions. Welcome to Literacy Talks, the podcast series from Reading Horizons, dedicated to exploring the ideas, trends, insights, and practical issues that will help us create literacy momentum. Our series host is Stacy Hurst, professor at Southern Utah University and chief academic officer at Reading Horizons, where reading momentum begins. Joining Stacy are Donnell Pons, a recognized expert in literacy and special education, and Lindsay Kemeny, a Utah-based elementary classroom teacher. Today's episode is a special opportunity for our listeners to meet Dr. Anita Archer, an internationally recognized and revered literacy leader, consultant, author, and curriculum developer. She's a frequent speaker at conferences worldwide, and we're so honored to have Dr. Archer as our special guest today. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Literacy Talks. My name is Stacy Hurst. I am the host, and I am joined as I am every episode with my awesome co-hosts, Donnell Pons and Lindsay Kemeny. And this week, Lindsay chose the topic that we get to talk about. So I'm just going to turn the time right over to you, Lindsay, and we can dive right in. Thank you. Well, I'm so excited for today because this summer I had the amazing opportunity to travel to Portland and spend four days learning from Dr. Anita Archer. And you guys know I've said before that Dr. Archer is my personal hero. And so it was amazing getting to learn from her. And I was so excited to come back and I wanted to share with you guys on the podcast some of the things I learned, but I have something even better today because we have Dr. Archer herself with us here today. So welcome, Dr. Archer. Well, thank you, Lindsay. And I just have to tell you, it's a delight to be here. You were an excellent student for those four days. Uh, and uh, I am honored to share information with your colleagues in Literacy Talks. Thank you. So let's start by um, having you tell us a little bit about your career. I believe you started off as a special education teacher. Is that right? I did. Actually, my career started before that. During my undergraduate career, I had the great gift of working with some renowned people in special ed doing research. And so I was a research assistant. And then I taught elementary special ed. And that's before I got my master's and then went on and got my doctorate. But, you know, I have taught thousands and thousands and thousands of lessons in elementary and middle school and high school, because most of my work has been in consulting and uh, teaching at universities. And so I've continued to teach children again and again and again. Just to give you a little bit of history, so I'm 75, so I've had 55 years in this career. During that time, special ed teacher, yes, but very early on at 26, I was asked to take a position at University of Washington as a visiting professor at 26. So I was extraordinarily blessed. All my degrees are from University of Washington because I'm a Washingtonian, though now I live in Portland, Oregon. Then I taught at University of Oregon and ran their reading school. Uh, All the services they gave to students I was in charge of and taught classes. But luckily, I was surrounded by very brilliant people uh, who had as their background direct instruction and had written many programs. Uh, So I learned a great deal from them. And then I taught at San Diego State University, which gave me another opportunity because of the number of students who were learning an additional language that they were serving as students in their classes. And also the teachers would be serving children. During that time, I continued to consult and write curriculum materials, but then all three jobs of university teaching, consulting, writing curriculum was plenty on my plate. And so I left the university and subsequently have been consulting in the United States, all 50 states, all territories, Uh, been consulting in Canada, particularly West Coast provinces. And in Australia, in Queensland, for 10 years, I've spent at least a month there. So I've had a really rich career. But most of it has been throughout that time is writing curriculum in the area of literacy. Well, that's fabulous. Yeah. And just all the people you've been able to impact. It's amazing. Aren't I blessed? 
You know, Dr. Archer, it was interesting listening to you talk about special education being one of those first settings that you were teaching in, because that was my first setting too, special education. So I have a real love for that. And then it got me thinking as you were talking about the various ways in which you've helped others uh, come to realize, you know, the impact they're teaching. It got me thinking about what explicit instruction is, because you're known as the queen of explicit instruction, which is fantastic, and who explicit instruction is for. And I hope we're all saying everybody, but I'll let you kind of take that over explicit instruction give us well, some- you're, you're right on everybody but one day a principal said well how do i know what uh, explicit instruction is and i said you know it when you see it because uh, the students will be engaged the instruction will be systematic the teacher will gain many many responses from the students constantly give them feedback and success will be the goal and learning is the outcome. So anytime you walk into a classroom, you can tell if it is explicit instruction and who is it for. Well, you know, Donnell, you know this well, there is a continuum in terms of instructional procedures from very explicit instruction which I tell you what you're going to learn. I systematically teach it to you. I check to be certain that you've learned it. And I adjust my instructions based on that information. Very, very explicit over here to total discovery, where you even can pick what you're going to learn and how you're going to go about it and how you're going to gain it. So we have this huge continuum. And so your question really is, What would end up at this end of the continuum? First of all, it's almost totally based on background knowledge. That is the biggie. Do you have something to connect it to what you're learning new? And if you have no background knowledge, which is pretty much elementary, middle school, and high school, and they walk into your class, it's because they don't have a lot of knowledge in that area. And so then they really profit from it being uh, very explicit because the instruction that way is not only effective, but efficient. Then when I gain lots of knowledge, like All of you have a huge amount of knowledge so that you can expand on it by personal discovery, picking up a book and then being able to sort through it. But we're mostly talking about students who are new to the content, are what we would call novices in that content area, who actually process differently than an expert. Thus, they need to have it be. Uh, very systematic and very explicit. So as you're talking, I'm thinking about a couple of different settings that I've been in. It kind of begs the question, what about discovery type learning or problem-based learning? You did speak to where that fits in. And if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you to address a specific example. I have worked with more than one Montessori school. And I really, as an early childhood educator, I appreciate that philosophy, but they are very discovery-based. How does that relate to early literacy instruction? You know, because I've not read all the research on Montessori, I'm not going to go there, but I'll go in general. One of the researchers that I follow is John Hattie, because John Hattie, uh, who uh, is basically a Kiwi from New Zealand, who now lives in Australia, and he has a team of researchers who take in information on certain questions that are very viable for us as educators. Uh, And one of them is, should we do problem-based instruction? Should we do discovery? And uh, many other, should we use explicit instruction? And they look at it in terms of taking the best studies and removing the ones that don't meet their criteria, and then coming up with what's called effect sizes. Uh, And effect sizes, basically, the name tells what it is. It's how effective is it. And they go from zero to one, uh, the effect sizes. And we pretty well have looked at and determined that if it has an effect size of 0.40 or more, then it is highly likely to make a difference and would be useful to add to our repertoire. But uh, the most recent data that uh, published was in 2019. And in 2019, I just wrote this down because luckily, uh, Lindsay sent me the questions, so I'd have data if you needed it. 
So if we look at the studies that looked at discovery, the overall effect size was 0.21. So that would be below what would uh, get us to say, woo-woo, let's do it. Problem-based instruction had a effect size of 0.35. Explicit instruction had an effect size of 0.57. So you get an idea of the difference in effectiveness. Now, in one of uh, John Hattie's recent books, and also a recent book by Dylan William, they both addressed this challenge and said the problem was that so often students were not given the amount of knowledge that they needed to solve a problem beforehand and that they really need to have that knowledge. So explicit instruction first before they would have a discovery or problem-based. Now, you think about us. We can discover why? Well, you doctor, 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 you've got doctorates, master's degrees. Uh, we've read about education forever. I own 5,000 books in my basement that are on education if you ever want one. And so we have the knowledge so that then we can solve a problem because we know what to look for and how to proceed and what we need to do. And this is true of any profession. You know, a plumber comes to my house and they have knowledge I don't have. I'm a novice in the plumbing department, but they're able to attack the problem because they have knowledge. So my conclusion is this. If we're going to do problem-based, authentic kinds of tasks, then let us precede it with explicit instruction on the knowledge we need, the skills we need, the vocabulary that we need. So also we have a level playing field. Everyone has enough knowledge now to do that authentic task. In fact, both of them concluded that without the preceding knowledge, that problem-based and discovery-based might have a negative impact on your attainment. So I think that speaks to us, and I think that we should be looking at that. It isn't an either and or. It is a win uh, and who, and how are we going to set you up for success? Okay. Oh, Dr. Archer, I love this. And I love you drawing this out for us and letting us really think about these various topics that we've heard of before and what they are and what how they impact education. So with that, I'd like it. We've talked about it, but I'm going to have you build out a little bit more. Can you give us an overview of the different components of explicit instruction? Because I may think I'm being explicit, but what is explicit instruction really? What are the components you want to see? Well, Lindsay took a class for four days on this, but you're not going to ask you, me, right? You're not going to no, ask, ask you. You know the answer. <laughs> uh, but, uh, Janelle, I'm going to give a summary of it, okay? So I wrote a book on explicit instruction with Charles Hughes at Penn State. And what we looked at was the research over 50 years on explicit instruction and what were the high leverage practices that consistently emerged. And we divided them into categories. And the first was content. That if I'm teaching you something explicitly, I'm going to focus on very high critical content, critical content that you could use in the moment and you could use in the future. But consistently, we know that we need to break it down into obtainable pieces, no matter what we're teaching. I don't teach seventh graders how to write an argument in one lesson. I'm going to break it down to obtainable pieces, you know, how to do the research, uh, how to determine what you're going to have as your claim. What are the reasons for your claim? How are we going to make a plan? Then how are we going to write a introduction uh, that grabs the attention of the reader, uh, that tells what your claim is, that previews the reasons? And we're going to do that one time, two time, three time, four time, more. And then we're going to learn how to write the paragraphs where you have a reason and details and reason and details. And then I'm going to teach you how to write a conclusion where you like wrap it up. So it is critical content. Learning how to write an argument is critical content, but it has to be broken down into obtainable pieces. 
And that's where a really good curriculum uses all of their knowledge to do that so that the students don't have cognitive overload. You know, every one of us have experienced a moment where too much is coming in and we are not able to process it within working memory. And we needed to have a smaller piece taught with demonstration and taught well so that then we can put it all together and have something that is complete. Second category is the design of instruction. And not surprising, the research showed that teachers who were most effective had organized systematic lessons. And what would that entail? Well, it would entail telling the students what they're going to learn, the purpose, sometimes even making it more formal, uh, as you're seeing today in schools where they have a learning intention and success criteria. Then review of any pre-skills or knowledge that you need for this lesson. So, for example, I was working yesterday with people who are utilizing one of my rewards, one of the research-validated programs I wrote with Dr. Mary Gleason. And a person asked, why do you have in every lesson a review of letter sounds and uh, pronunciation of prefix and suffixes? I said, because uh, the strategy we're teaching is dependent on that knowledge to automaticity. And so you get a long word and you ask yourself, how are you going to figure it out? Uh, and we teach them to circle the prefix, but they've got to know the prefix. Circle the suffix, they'd have to know it. Underline the vowel sound, they'd have to know it. Say the part, say it fast, make it a real word. So... We're going to tell the kids the goal of the lesson, but we're going to review any necessary pre-skills, like in the example, before they are going to uh, have new material. And uh, then when we get to new material, we have divided it up into three parts, demonstration, guided practice, checking for understanding, or what I coined in 1974, the terms, I do it, we do it, you do it. But you know, one of the things that we have to remember is, for me as a writer and author of books and materials, is that there is a great deal of history that came before. And so I'm always very careful to talk about the roots of this, because it wasn't just all my ideas. In fact, that one's a perfect example. During the 1980s, probably the premier educator was Madeline Hunter. And Madeline Hunter talked about demonstration, guided practice, checking for understanding. And then when I wrote a chapter in a book, I wanted terms that were more memorable. So I adopted I do, we do, you do. Often I do it, we do it, you do it. But it is off of a longer pathway, a longer history that we need to honor uh, the roots of good instructional practice in education. So that's the design. Delivery, we put a lot of energy, and I do in my trainings, to delivery because we could have an organized, focused lesson. We could even have the goal. We could have review. We could have I do it, we do it, you do it. And the students are going into deep cognitive floating. Why? Number one, they're not asked to make enough responses. The opportunities to respond in a lesson is one of the best predictions of learning within the lesson. And then the teacher needs to monitor those responses, listening carefully, looking carefully. Then the teacher needs to give feedback based on the responses. And have a brisk pace throughout. So the delivery of it, those are the four big ones. Frequent responses, monitoring the responses, giving feedback, uh, and having a brisk or perky pace. And then the last area is practice. Giving an adequate amount of practice spaced over time that will lead to learning. Just look at all of the knowledge we have that has to come to our curriculum material designs, to our teaching in the classroom, to our university teaching, so that 
teachers have from the get go a vision of a mental map about what good instruction looks like. And that's like, Stacy, you're teaching at university and you know that the first mental map that people get in any career is very difficult to change over time. So they've got to get this idea. They need to watch videos and see lots of good instruction so that they know what it looks like. So that is the components as we've organized them. And there's probably more than one way to organize them, but in terms of content, design, delivery, and practice. I love that, Dr. Archer. And I love that you had us really practice and We did retrieval practice ourselves this summer because we would write down all the 13, you know, every day, every class, you would have us write down that 13 until everyone could write all 13 from memory. And you did it on like the second day. (laughs) I'm impressed you remember, but it's so good because like you said, I love how you're talking about that mental map because that's really what I think of. And I, okay, what of these areas do I need to work on and what, what Mm -hmm. can I do? So if a principal or a teacher came to you, because there's all these different elements of explicit instruction that are so important, but if they came to you and just said, what is one thing we can do? What's one thing we can work on to improve the learning outcomes for our students? What would you say? You know what I would say, Lindsay. (laughs) Uh, I would say, give all of your effort to opportunities to respond. Basically, here's some of my mottos in terms of opportunities to respond. That number one, everybody does everything, whether it's a small or large group. Everybody says it, everybody writes it, everybody does it. Because one of the first things we need to do is move away from the long historical use of raised hands. Because we still see this predominant in schools. I ask a question, the students raise their hands. So I call on that student. And who are they likely to be? They are likely to be students that are high-performing students, confident, assertive students, and students that are proficient in English, which I call teaching the best and leaving the rest. But it is harmful because very quickly, other students in the classroom, particularly at the secondary level, learn this student, this student, and this student are the hand raisers. Well, they're probably right here. Donnell, Stacy, and Lindsay, you'd be raising your hand. Uh, And so teachers constantly calling on them, giving them all of the practice. uh, And other children just say, it's their job, I'm checking out. So that's the first thing I work with schools on. If we're going to do everyone does everyone thing, everyone says the answer, everybody writes the answer, everybody does the answer, then we need to get rid of the raised hands. My teachers teach students on the first day of school that in my class, when I ask a question, you won't raise your hand. The only time you're going to raise your hand is if I say, raise your hand. Or if you have a question for me that is useful to everybody else in the classroom, not just to you, but to everyone else, then you may raise your hand. So then we have to teach them, well, what can we do instead? Uh, And we have a whole array of possibilities for saying. You could have students say answers together when the answers are short and the same. You could have structured, structured partners assigned like one and two or A and B, where you give them a chance to think and they share it with their partner before you call on a student. You could have written responses, maybe on slates. Uh, Maybe you're going to have answers on paper. We found particularly at the secondary level, having students write down their ideas before they share it with their partner or the class, the quality goes way up in terms of their responses. Same in college classes. And they could also do things. They could touch things, point to things. They could... My favorites are the holdups, though. Some of the strongest research in terms of opportunities to respond are holdups. Everybody writes it on their slate, holds it up. Everybody not only uh, maybe has cards in front of them, and they hold them up. So one day I saw a teacher who had cards, 
in a social studies class in the middle school, the executive branch, legislative branch, judicial branch. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about some aspect of this branch. You must identify it. When I say show me, you're going to hold it up. So hold ups, another great one is you have multiple possibilities for answers. You ask an item, the students look on the screen and decide if it's one, two, three, or four, and they show it with their fingers. Now you might say, well, why did holdups come out so well in the research? Is consistently one of the strongest possibilities. Well, because I can hold everybody accountable, which when people write things down, uh, unless it's short and they hold it up, I'm not going to be able to look at all their papers at that moment. Or if they say it to their partner, I can't hear everybody, but I can see everybody. Are they participating? Do they have the correct answer? So it's a very strong way to hold them accountable and get a better view of the class gains. So I don't have any problem with this question at all. I have said it a million times to principals. You want to make a difference. We're going to start by increasing opportunities to respond. I just worked yesterday all day in Hawaii virtually. Uh, and so we've been working for two years on a literacy grant. And that was the first thing we worked on. And uh, it has gotten better and better and better. But here's the other reason, Lindsay, uh, in terms of why I would want to do that is that when you increase opportunities to respond, your lessons have to be more organized and focused. You need to know where you're going. So it impacts that. If you have more opportunities to respond, you have more opportunities to acknowledge and praise children. So it changes the environment in the classroom. If you have opportunities to respond, you get feedback as a teacher on are they getting it? So in other words, why we start there is that it affects everything else. Wow, thanks for that. It's a lot to think of. I'm beginning my semester and I have a million and 10 ideas. So one question I do have for you, could you say more about how you would adjust those response opportunities for different age groups or instructional settings? The content demands the response, not the group of learners. So Lindsay was in a class with people that were all, all had undergraduate degrees. I would say the majority of them had masters. And remember, Lindsay, there were three people with doctorates in the audience. Yes. Okay. And did you say things together? Yes, we did. Uh, did you use hand signals? We did. Did you share with partners? Yes. Did you share with teams? Yep. Did you make short written responses? Yes. The end. <laughs> uh, and so I want to have a short response in return to some information I've taught. I had them say it together. We had long answers. I had them write down their ideas and share with their partner or their team. So that was a university level class. Now, let's say we go down to kindergarten. So I just met with kindergarten teachers last Monday, and we're starting the year with only using one major method of response, which is choral responses. Listen, say, listen, say. Takes a few weeks for kindergarten kids to get this. Well, a few days, actually. And they were really good at it. And then we work on point two, touch. And so, yes, that's differentiated uh, until we get a whole repertoire of potential responses that the teacher could choose that would match the content. Wonderful. So one area that I want to improve this year is in the review section of my lesson. And you just shared some great advice with us this summer about that review section that I'm wondering if you can share some of that with us about what makes a good review. Okay, so uh, let's go back to something you mentioned from that summer class, is that every day after I introduced the major components of explicit instruction, you had two minutes from memory to list them. Mm -hmm. I didn't just go back and recap them all. 
uh, I had you come up with them from memory and write them down. And then the next day, the same thing. And the next day, the same thing. Because we had on the first day rehearsed it quite a bit. And now we are into retrieval. And retrieval practice is very powerful in terms of digging deep neural pathways uh, that lead to retention. So if we can just, here we have a body of knowledge I want you to learn. We rehearse. Well, first I teach. Then we rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Then we retrieve, retrieve, retrieve. Now, in your question you gave me, you said, could you give me a literacy example? Okay. So just to show you, because we did many, I think three times I showed you, I did one uh, with uh, just a recap and one with retrieval. But let me take you to a classroom where I was visiting. So I was visiting a school district and giving uh, feedback to teachers in walkthroughs. So we're doing walkthroughs and we're in the kindergarten and the principal's sitting here. I'm sitting here and we're taking notes watching a kindergarten teacher who is teaching uh, literacy skills uh, and is reviewing letter sound associations. Okay, so then we're all familiar with teaching letter sound associations. So the teacher gets up and puts up a flashcard and says, this is the letter B. Its sound is, say the sound. This sound is A. Ah. What sound? A. Ah. This sound is the letter T. Its sound is T. What sound? T, T. And the principal wrote down, excellent job going back and reviewing what you taught. Then I said to the principal, let's step out in the hall and have a discussion. I said, here's the problem. The teacher is recapping, is modeling the name of the letter and the sound. The students do not have to retrieve it from memory. And inadvertently, this teacher is teaching the children, you don't really have to focus in and learn it because every day I'm going to tell you the sound again and you're going to then mimic that sound. He said, well, what should she do? And I said, well, excellent that she's having review. We'll celebrate that. Uh, but she should simply put up the letter B and say, what sound? Uh, and then, yes. And what sound? Ah. Uh, and so, ah, I see. Then the students are held accountable. And the students have to retrieve it. And the practice is much more likely to lead to retention. So we got to look at how we review. Now, that would occur after I've taught it and we have rehearsed it with scaffolding. We've rehearsed it with scaffolding. And now I'm taking the scaffolding down and in our retrieval review, there'll be no scaffolding. And you scaffold it for us when we were doing those 13, writing those down. I mean, the first time you gave us the topics, content, design, delivery, mm -hmm. practice, and then we would write, you know, and, and then by the end, yeah, just do it. Yes, exactly. Well, nice remembering, Lindsay, you are a delight as a student. <laughs> Thank you. you everywhere. Yes. And your students are lucky to have you because of that, Lindsay. <laughs> You're a good learner. I was thrilled to know that you coined the term. I do. We do. You do. I learned that a long time ago and it made a really big difference in the way I thought about teaching and what my students need. And as you're talking and you just barely said, teach, rehearse, 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 retrieve, that's another way of saying it, right? But out of those three, I do, we do, you do, which would you say is the most important? Well, anything, any skill or strategy that I'm teaching you, I better demonstrate it clearly, clearly articulate what I'm doing and what I am thinking. And... I might do that more than one time. I might demonstrate it one time, two times, depending on the complexity. Then we have the we do it and where I'm going to guide you in doing it. I'm going to go step by step, supporting you through scaffolding so that you could do it correctly and then gradually reduce the amount of scaffolding and then check to see if you could do it independently. Now, here's the sad thing is Stacy, the most common use of I do it, we do it, you do it, is I do it, you do it. Watch me do this math problem, now you do it. Uh, watch me write a paragraph, now you do it. But 
And the strongest part of the lesson actually is we do it and where I am as the expert guiding you through it. Just think of a plumber saying, uh, watch me connect these two. Now you do it. Whoa. Uh, you know, maybe they need to give some advice as they do the we do it. All of us would profit from we do it. Now, let me just, can I take an example from yesterday? So yesterday I was working uh, with third, fourth, and fifth graders, teachers of and interventionists on the big island, Hawaii. Actually, yesterday was Oahu. The previous day was, I should go there. I mean, really. But anyway, <laughs> Portland had good weather yesterday too. So uh, we were talking about teaching students how to utilize context clues. And one of the simple strategies that you could utilize is inside outside, where you have a word you don't know the meaning of. First, you look inside the word and ask yourself, do I know the root? Do I know a prefix or suffix? And if from that, you can't figure out the word. Then you look in the sentence and ask yourself, are there any hints in the sentence? And then if that's not enough, you ask yourself, is there any hints uh, in the surrounding sentences that will help me get to the meaning? And when I figure out possibly what the meaning is, then I try it in the sentence and I ask myself, does it make sense? Okay, you've got the strategy down inside, outside, very easy. And I could model that and I might model it one time, two times. But there's all types of embedded context clues. It could be just stated right after the word. It could be uh, uh, later on they ha have a, another word that means the same, or they have an antonym that is meant to cue you in, or maybe a cause and effect is to cue you in. So there's a whole range. So I'm going to have to guide you to lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of practice before you ever would do it on your own so that I can cover all of the possibilities over time. And it might be over time. So it's the same thing if I was teaching you how to write a paragraph. You know, I could model. First, we, have, we plan the topic sentence, then we plan the details, and then we plan the concluding sentence, and then I show them how to write it. But that's going to take a lot of doing it together and guiding them and doing it and guiding them, particularly if they're like third graders or fourth graders. So the we do it should not be neglected. And I see so often children have watched you do it, but they need you to be right there guiding them through it so that there is outcome hope. So we make this error, we make it in literacy. I know that literacy talks, but, you know, somebody who's watching teaches math too. Uh, and we do it all the time in math. Watch me do this problem. Now do items one through 50 uh, on your own. Bless you. No, it would have been helpful if we had some guided practice. What's the first step? Do it. What's the second step? Do it. What's the third step? Do it. What's the fourth step? Do it. Here's your answer. Compare it to mine. Let's look at the next problem. First step, do it. Second step, do it. Third step, do it. So it is the we do it. I remember you had a slide this summer and it said, you know, it's not always I do it, we do it, you do it, but sometimes it's I do it, we 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 do it, and then you do it. You know, but Lindsay, that was an important uh, thing for you to remember because sometimes I'll see evaluation tools that say, I'm in this lesson, did I see an I do it, we do it, you do it? Well, many times, just like you said, it would be done over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yes, you could do a demonstration and maybe another demonstration. And the next day uh, you're doing we do it and we do it and we do it for many, many days. And the students go on holiday. They come back. You do one more demonstration and then you do we do it. We do it. Now they're looking better and you're gradually reducing the scaffolding enough that you can say you do it. And that then get, opens the door for independent practice. 
And that scaffolding is important too. And you showed that on the slide because the, the font of the we do it got smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> we like to make things so that the whole message, what I'm saying and what I see is all one message. So yes, the font time. Certainly I might have told you about the number of times though that I will send a handout with the font side being a message and uh, a secretary will look at it and say, oh no, this does not look right. And they'll just fix it right up. So it's all 14 and it was meant to be 14, oh, eight. Well, and I love that because it's a good reminder and something I can think about is, you know, I can scaffold with my, with, the amount of prompting and help I give, I can be telling my students, now remember our A, we're going to do slant down, slant down, across, right? And then I can start pulling that away and just saying, let's write your capital A and then, you know, pulling that right. back. Absolutely. So another goal um, for my instruction this year is the closing. So we talked about your review, the body of our lesson, I do, we do, you do, and then the closing, which I always forget to do. So this is why it's a goal for me. And I know that you said that this is really common that people forget to do a closing in their lesson. So let's you know, talk. You about know, we have an opening to our lesson or we tell the goal and we do a review and then we have the body of the lesson uh, that's organized and focused that includes uh, I do it, we do it, you do it. And then we have a closing. Uh, and uh, closing is definitely, it doesn't matter if you are a primary teacher, uh, an intermediate teacher in an elementary school, a middle school, a high school, or college, it's missing in all of them. Uh, most of us teach up until the bell and storm the door is not a closing. <laughs> there is some academic benefit and some behavioral benefit of having dignity at the end. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a long one. For example, some of uh, your participants are interventionists, and maybe they're only with the kids for half an hour. And so then they might have a closing that was five minutes or less. And maybe I'm a high school teacher and I have 45 minute periods, but five minutes before the bell, I stop and uh, systematically do a closing. What are the academic benefits? Well, the way I articulate it is this. Review, preview, independent work. Review means I'm going to go over the big ideas. And uh, if we haven't had a lot of rehearsal yet, I'll use retrieval practice. I will ask questions or items that they're going to do that will show me, remind them of what we've had. But here's the benefit. Often it is a synopsis. And many of our kids, when everything else is gone, are more likely to get it from that synopsis. A lot of ahas uh, in that moment. Then we might have a preview. Kids like to know that we have a plan, that tomorrow we're going to continue working on inside, outside. Tomorrow we are going to learn a new sound. Uh, and I'm so excited about this sound because there's so many words with this sound. And uh, so... You have to have passion no matter what you teach so that the students have some security that you know where you're going. And then if there's uh, homework or assignment in class that they're going to do, you do that. So that's the academic benefits. You have had a review. It might have been a recap if we haven't had much rehearsal. It could be a, a retrieval practice if it is something that we are pretty firm on. Then you know where we're going and you have an assignment. But the behavioral aspects also is critical. If we just storm the door and leave the classroom, we're just setting them up for push and shove and unruly behavior. But instead, we have dignity at the end. This is what we learned. Review that. Here's what we're doing tomorrow. And then, if I'm an elementary teacher, and we are maybe moving on, for some other activity, uh, I'll excuse kids. Row one, row two, row three, dignity to the end. Even in a middle school class, right after I've done this quick review and the bell's about ready to ring, I'll say, stay in your seats and I'll walk over and position my body next to the door so I can say goodbye to them as they leave. And I will say, Think when the bell rings, remember, do not leave until I tell you to. That's my 
mantra in middle school and high school. Do not move until I tell you to. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Please walk to the door. Thank you. So academic and behavioral benefits. But you know, I tell this story because it was fascinating to me. I'm working in middle schools, a lot in middle schools. And we talked about having closure and we just never got it. So then we decided to have a ding bell that's not the real bell across the school. And that was a reminder. There's five minutes left. You need to review. Okay. Uh, And they didn't. So we went into classes and uh, we picked out a child, the teacher's choice, this child, uh, and we tell them their job. Five minutes before the bell rings, you're going to stand up. You're in the front row. You're going to stand up. And you're going to stay standing until the teacher does something that looks like closure. Maybe saying something, let's wrap this up. Uh, or let's go over what we did today, something that looks like closure, and then you can sit down. But until the teacher does that, you are not sitting down. And then we introduced it to the class. Five minutes before, Jason's going to stand up, uh, and he'll keep standing until there is closure. Okay, guess what? We got closure. And then the teachers got in the habit of it. But still, we had little personal reminder person. They loved the job. They did it consistently. Anita, I've been chuckling my head. My first teaching gig was in a middle school. That just makes me laugh just hearing about it. That's so fantastic. I love it. Um, I Along this line, Anita, you throughout your career, you've come up with some of the greatest short phrases and mottos, and many people fondly refer to them. What are some of your favorite archerisms? Have you got a favorite out there? Well, many. But basically, that for example, I do it, we do it, you do it, is an archerism. And the reason for it was to make it memorable, that it would stick with us. So this summer, I had a, a terrific opportunity. And that was a class that I had taught at University of Oregon 50 years ago, 48 years ago, had a reunion for me. And they remembered archerisms. There's many we could go through, but you asked what my favorites were. And some of them are not around literacy, but management. And the one they remembered was uh, avoid the void for they will fill it, which I think is probably one of the best reminders. Don't you think it's a good reminder for teachers? Because most management problems do come where there is a void. I've either finished the task and you have not regained our attention or you did not prepare enough today, teacher, and there's a void and in it management problems because children will fill the void. (laughs) And some children have a whole range of inappropriate behaviors that they use to fill the void. So avoid the void for they will fill it. My other one is that almost all management problems, you could envision that they were going to happen. Uh, And uh, this goes for parents as well as teachers. So if you expect it, pre-correct it. If you expect it, pre-correct it. Uh, And this makes a huge difference. So if you can expect this, this is going to happen, like I was in a chemistry class and the teacher did a brilliant job with this because for the first times they were going to have these uh, lit torches that they were going to be using. And so the teacher said, you will not turn on your torch until I give you the command. No one did it. And, but this is absolutely, you're going to assign partners. Before you ever assign partners, you know some kids are going to go, ew. So you pre correct it. Today, you're going to get a partner. You're going to just have that partner for three weeks only, and then I'll change them. We're a learning community, and I expect you to be kind no matter who your partner is. So when I assign your partner, not with your face or with your voice, will there be any negative comments? If you expect it, pre-correct it. I love that. There's so many. I don't think I could choose a favorite archerism. I know um, 
teach the stuff and cut the fluff. That was like my motto a couple of years ago, especially with COVID and we were every other day. And that was just, that was my main goal. Let me just comment on that one. So that goes back to critical content, teach the stuff and cut the fluff. So if I have a curriculum material, I have to decide what's fluff. But then if I have a curriculum, let's say it's a general ed curriculum and my students are way behind, then I might have to more deeply cut fluff so that we can fill in this and take them to the level we might normally expect, which is definitely the result of COVID, right? Yes. So that the differential is greater. So we have to even be more selective about what we teach so that we can cover more in this space. So if we have like a list of vocabulary words, and we might usually teach all nine, but now we need to cover more content. We look at it and say, well, that word they're never going to hear again, never use again. But this word they could use in their reading, they could use in their writing and There's other words related to it, so I can get more for my money for that word. So it is a really critical one that you remembered. And then the other one you told us, don't commit a suicide. And uh, I love that. And then this week was our first week of school and my first year teaching first grade. And guess what I did? I committed a suicide. (laughs) You know, and with first graders, there's nothing to assume. (laughs) But even something like, okay, in first grade, which you're teaching, lucky you, (laughs) really lucky. But let's say in maybe three weeks, you want to introduce structured partners. And so you're going to teach the students to look at their partner, to lean in towards their partner and whisper. And so you're going to model it and you're going to practice it, right? But let's say that I'm working with seventh graders and on the first day of school, I'm going to introduce structured partners. Now, I'm not going to assume that all of them have been taught those school behaviors of look, lean, and whisper. And so in a voice that is more appropriate for seventh graders, I'm going to reteach it. I'm going to teach that. And I'm going to have them practice it uh, because we're going to use it all on. And I might give more rationale to the seventh graders than the first graders. The seventh graders, I would say, we're learning this because, first of all, what you're conveying with your partners should not be heard by other partnerships. So they have to develop their own ideas. Uh, And also, it is a social skill that you can use beyond this, that when you're in a restaurant and you're talking, you have someone with you, you lean towards them so that you can hear them well. You whisper so that not people at the other tables are going to hear you. This is a skill that's for our classroom and way beyond. So you get more rationale, but you're not going to assume. And every time we assume, then we have to back up because we are like shocked. Oh my gosh, I, I just assumed they knew that. Oh my goodness, I assumed they knew that. Now, so yes, don't yeah. commit suicide. That's exactly what happened. I thought I could say, write three capital A's. I showed it, go to your C and write three capital A's and three lowercase A's. And that was not happening. So <laughs> I learned my lesson by Thursday. We had to do it all together on the paper. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Touch down, touch down, touch across. Yes. I think even some of my college students would benefit from that particular lesson. <laughs> that is great. I And it is easier, I think, in my university setting to commit a suicide. And we're really going to make that a focus to make sure I'm not doing that. Academically, of course, doing quick pretests of information can reduce that. And then it, you're like shocked to find out they have no idea what this is. And then you'd better like teach it. So academically, some of that can be removed through pretests. Yeah, I love that. And I'm so glad you said that because I have, that has been front of mind, literally, as I'm planning for this next semester, I need to do a better job of that and my closures. In fact, I think I teach all my classes this year in one room. I think on the back wall, I'm going to put storm. The door is not a closure. (laughs) <laughs> that is so good. But you know, Stacy, all the years I taught in university, I had posters. I modeled for teachers what they needed to do in their teaching. So I had posters up of the behaviors I'm working on because, yes, 55 years of only thinking about instruction 
I still have a long ways to go. I can watch videos that I've just done three years or four years ago before COVID and say, oh, Archer, you needed to do this. You need to do this. So I would post it so everybody knew what I was working on. But I would love teachers to do this, you know, have a sign that everyone does everything for the teacher who constantly calls on kids to raise their hands. And so they're reminded that everyone is going to be saying answers, writing answers, doing answers. One like if you expect it, pre-correct it could be an excellent behavioral to have up so that you're looking at it. But also it conveys to children that this is a profession. And like any profession, learning is not a one and done. It's constant, getting better and better and better. And you're only as good in your profession as your willingness to become better and better and better. So you're really teaching kids something in terms of a value that would be very obvious to them. Yeah, that is so beneficial for me to be thinking about right now and for all of us to be. And I think I know in my position, I'm a relatively new professor. This will be my third year of teaching in the university level. And initially my thought was content, content. I just got to get the information to them. They haven't been taught about what we're calling the science of reading. I need to just get it out to them. But I've been able to start thinking about, yes, I need to be modeling being a learner, just like you just have done for us. And showing them what it looks like to continue to elevate your professional practice and the profession as a whole. So I am trying to put that more front and center um, this year, too. If you're training teachers, you must teach them in the same way that they would teach. So you have to work on your opportunities to respond. You have to work on your opening and your closing. uh, But you might even want to articulate it for them that my instruction is meant to mirror your instruction. And so we're going to have an opening and we're going to have a body of the lecture and then we're going to have a closing and you're going to participate throughout. And uh, Lindsay can tell you that I even had a person count the opportunities to respond that I had during the sessions as feedback to me so that they would really understand Uh, That good instruction is always interactive. It doesn't matter uh, the age because you have to rehearse the information and retrieve it in order to retain it. Yeah, I I love that. I agree. And I'm going to be more explicit about my explicit instruction. That's exactly what you're going to do and already do, I'm sure. So one thing when we're teaching vocabulary, um, I actually have my students watch three of your videos on explicit vocabulary instruction. And then as part of a retrieval opportunity, I ask them to tell me what they learned from those videos. So I have Mm -hmm. semesters worth of those comments, but um, there is just one that I'd like to read to you today because I think it encapsulates some of the things that you've been talking about. And this is certain that everybody knows that the videos are available to them. Yes. Explicitinstruction.org. Great resource, by the way. So yes, explicitinstruction.org. So the student said, I feel that using this type of explicit instruction requires not only the engagement of the students, but the teacher as well, which I really appreciated that she noticed that because again, my main focus was vocabulary at that point. Um, And she said, Dr. Archer demonstrated mastery of the content in the way she spoke And that is one of the characteristics I aspire to as a teacher. So you are inspiring many teachers and future teachers. And then she said this, I may just be a nerd, but even after watching that first video had me engaged and on the edge of my seat. And I already knew what those words meant. (laughs) (laughs) And it's all we nerds. Yes. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Uh, Uh, But you know, that is for you to show videos of good instruction is that mental map that we want to give teachers because she already knows what it looks like, what it feels like. But what she noticed is how present teachers have to be. And this is true. It's that mindfulness thing that many people are looking into, but it is that presence that your whole energy is there. You're not looking at your Apple watch. You are not answering the phone. You took it off the hook so that no one could call you during a lesson. You are not doing anything except being present uh, and connecting with them. And it is of all professions, 
it has a more need of being present because oh, I can't monitor my instructional quality without being present. I can't give feedback without being present. I can't give positive praise without being present. I can't smile at you without being present. I must be present. Wow. That is a good closure (laughs) and a profound thought to end on. I think you must be present in our instruction. We cannot thank you enough for joining us today. You know, you asked me one thing, though. You didn't, you skipped the last question. You're a wonderful example of lifetime learning. What kinds of things are you doing now that contribute to your own learning? And I'm all prepared. Okay. Uh, Well, (laughs) yes, we would love to hear that answer to your question. Well, it goes with the last comment. I could come in and watch a lesson and I could check you off for, you have an opening of a body of clothes. You have uh, a goal in your lesson. You have a retrieval practice review. You have, I do it, we do it, you do it. You have closure. I could check those off. But there is, on the other hand, Besides those procedures that are research validated and need to occur, there are certain attributes of humans that are particularly good at teaching that they maintain. So I was teaching at a conference in um, Eugene, and there was a group of people from Great Britain, and we had lots of discussions. And uh, one of them said, Have you read the book? by Banner and Cannon. And it's a Brit, uh, British book. I said, no. And he said, well, you really need to, which I really needed to. It's for the whole aspect of the character of a teacher. It is called The Elements of Teaching, written in 1997, revised in 2017. Only one of the authors is now living. Think about this. It speaks to your hearts and our souls as teachers. Our mission is a mission. It's not just a job. It is not even a career. It is a mission. And I just wrote down the ones that touched me. One was authority. That the teacher has to convey that they are the authority in the classroom. Uh, That they know what you need to learn and how we're going to get there and how we'll know if you get there. It is not authority like being mean or demanding. It is authority. I know what I'm doing. You're lucky to be in my classroom. You're going to learn a lot. And I'm going to have you totally involved, but I'll be making the decisions. And that there is order. There's order in terms of what I'm teaching in the sequences. There's order in terms of the arrangement of the space in my classroom. There is order in terms of how I proceed in every lesson. Uh, There is order in terms of my expectation that there is order, that there is compassion, that we remember we're teaching human beings. One boy once told me I was a great teacher and I asked why. And he says, well, you teach with passion and you manage with compassion. A fourth grader, you teach with passion you manage with compassion and that you have patience, giving them uh, time to learn it. If it takes many, we do it. It's fine. We're going to do it. And tenacity. We're never giving up. We're never giving up. Children deserve us never giving up. I'll try it another way. I'll do more. We do it. I'll go back and demonstrate it again. I will explain it to you after school. Tenacity, tenacity, tenacity. But think about that, those kind of attributes that we bring into the field goes along with very good practice. And one of them was learning. So when I teach, the whole goal is learning. That is what we're paid to do. That is the outcome we're doing. Unless it gets in permanent memory, it hasn't been learned. Our goal is learning. But also I have a responsibility as a professional to continue to learn. For example, today, these are the studies that I'm reviewing on just one issue. How should multisyllabic words be taught, which is my research area, but those are the newest articles on it. I'm committed to learning. 
so that I can get better and better and better. But I love this book because even though I teach high leverage practices that make a difference, these are the human aspects that are necessary to bring to our field. I also love that you share what you learn. You could just apply it and probably be happy, but we benefit from you being a learner and sharing with us what you've learned. So thank you. Well, this has been a total delight. I hope it has been just what you wanted. I would come back anytime and talk to you guys. You are committed to this and doing a great service for many people by having these special podcasts. We love them. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Lindsay, for the idea. And I just want you to know, I left a faculty meeting to be able to do this. And I would do that a million times over. I was totally supported in that, by the way. Everybody wanted to come with me. And I said, no, you'll just have to listen to the podcast. All right. Well, we will have you you visit Southern Utah University someday. You know, I have been there and I would definitely return. I'm good for COVID to pass for I travel a lot and I hope it's soon. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us today on Literacy Talks. And thank all you participants for listening in. Teach with passion, manage with compassion. Great closure. Thank you. And then join us next time on our next episode of Literacy Talks. Thanks for listening to Literacy Talks, the podcast series for literacy leaders and champions everywhere. Literacy Talks comes to you and your colleagues from Reading Horizons, where reading momentum begins. Visit readinghorizons.com slash literacy talks often for resources, ideas, and great literacy learning conversations. Subscribe to our podcast digest, and you'll always be up to date on all things literacy. See you next time.